Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to another day, another opportunity, another breath of life, another great, great moment to enjoy what it is you've got. And that is uh, the most wonderful life ever here in this world. Thank you so much for being with us. We are so grateful. My name is Dave. This is Steve. Every week we get together to talk about mules and donkeys. And uh, wouldn't you know it, this week is not an exception. We're making it happen. And we are so glad that you are here with us. Tell you what we would love to have you do, especially if this is your first time. Go ahead and let us know that you're watching. Uh, in the comments section, we love to see who's with us today. And so if you'd put your name where you're watching from and what the weather's like in the comment section, that would be fantastic. We'd love to say hello to you, uh, know where you're watching from throughout the world and just what it's like to be you, at least as far as what it feels like to be in your skin with the weather around you. Uh, out here in Arizona, I'm in Chandler, Arizona. Steve, of course, is in Queen Valley, Arizona, and it is beautiful. It's been it's been tempting, uh, tempting uh, to say it's going to rain. I don't think I've seen rain. Have you seen rain out there yet today, Steve? No, nah, not some clouds, but that's about it. It's teasing us. Maybe we'll get some tonight. Maybe we won't, but no matter what, we're grateful for what we got. It's been beautiful. Second thing that we ask is that you uh, go ahead and let us know any and every mule or donkey question that you have. You are the one that drives the program. Matter of fact, you should be the one driving and leading your mule too, but that's another story. We'll make sure you know how to do that here before we're at the at the end. But you are the one that drives the program here too. So whatever you are working through, we would love to know it uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, we think that owning a mule or a donkey should be one of the most rewarding experiences of your life. You shouldn't feel like you're going to come in from a day of training, a day of riding, a day of driving, and just want to throw your hat on the ground and, and you know, kind of turn it all in. We don't want that. We want you to say, that was the best ride of my life. I can't wait to get back out there tomorrow. And if you can't get out there tomorrow, we want you chomping at the bit, so to speak, to get out there the next time you can. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is that your question helps the greater mule and donkey community. And we find out so many times, week in and week out, uh, there's a lot of horse folks out there who uh, probably mean the best, probably mean real well, but they know horses. They don't know the mule and they don't know the donkey. And so if you don't ask your question, we won't have a chance to answer it. And if we don't have a chance to answer it, there's going to be folks out there who are going to go listen to a horse person who means well, but doesn't necessarily know that what they're saying isn't going to turn out the best for the mule or the owner. So you ask your question, we'll get it answered, and you can help the mule and donkey community uh, for years to come because these replays stay up and folks keep watching them. Third thing is that we ask you share the broadcast. It's real easy to do. We've already got our friends on Facebook and YouTube chiming in. All you got to do is click the share button on YouTube. You click share, send it out to someone, then click like, subscribe, and that lets YouTube know that, hey, what we're doing here is worthwhile. On Facebook, very similar. You click the share button and then you tag a friend or family member in the comments section. And that's how more folks hear about this. That's how we make a difference in the world. And a matter of fact, folks all over the world are hearing what it is Steve Edwards has learned about the mules and donkeys. And by golly, we're changing the world. One mule owner, one donkey owner at a time. Steve, how has the week been since we uh, last hung out? Uh, it's been uh, been busy per usual for me. I can tell you that my uh, uh, sciatic nerve problem that I had on my right leg, which was just absolutely painful, is now next to nothing. I uh, went and seen the surgeon, and he says, well, we're going to put a little slice here, and we're going to cut in here. And I said, no, nah, I don't really want to do that. And he said, well, we're going to put a shot in there and do this. I said, no, nah, I don't really want to do that. So I went and seen a chiropractor, and I've been – uh, exercising and stretching and uh, keeping busy. And I guarantee you right now, Dave, I have no pain at all. I had a, a couple people contact me and say, hey, try this or try that. And then mule people got some ideas. I think the best idea was, hey, go ride a mule. <laughs> We're not giving out any official prescriptions, but we think not a whole lot will get worse when you're out there riding a mule. And uh, it is a it is a pretty good pretty good life when you can get out there. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, you know, I was, I was listening to music on the way in this morning. Of course we don't get, 
uh, we don't get into faith a whole lot, but we're not afraid to. And when you were talking about just coming in, it just, there was this song playing and it said, uh, same God in the old days at the beginning and same God today. And you were a healer back then and you are a healer now. And so that's really encouraging to hear. I love hearing stories, uh, whether it is directly, you know, scientific or if it's a miracle or if it's just the miracle of uh, medicine and science and chiropractor. We'll take it. And so I'm glad to hear that, Steve. That makes me happy. Um, say hello to Polly, who's watching from Barnesville, Minnesota, four degrees above and cold. Uh, yeah, I'll say the mules aren't bothered by the flies, though. There we go. Uh, top of the Ridge. Hello from Colorado. It's sunny and 19 degrees today. It feels warm compared to the past few days. Hey, Sherman Johnson, Johnson Taxidermy, Norman, Oklahoma, 23 degrees, uh, sleet raining. And Steve, check this out. How about that right there? That is, that hey. is Sherman. That's Sherman right there. He says, yeah, uh, he says, this is my Miss B, my six-year-old Molly Mule. I've had her since she was 16 months old, and I have trained her to ride using Steve's techniques with the trail light saddle and all the tack that goes with it. Thanks, guys, for all the training and support. Sherman Johnson, Norman, Oklahoma. How fun is that? Yeah. Hey, look at that T-shirt, too. How about Woo! that? What's he got on there, Steve? He's got, he's got the newest, latest, greatest T-shirt. I made a deal with people. I said, tell you what, the t-shirt costs $22 plus shipping. But if you will send me a picture back like Sherman did here, if you will take a picture, send it back, the shirt's only going to cost you $12. So, hey, everybody that done that got themselves a smoking deal. But we got folks like Sherman here that are sending us back some pictures. And it's great. And notice here, come along, Hitch, right there. All right, golly. That's awesome. I've got one from uh, from uh, Vicky too. I think it is, um, and I'll or it's or no Barbara. I think it's Barbara that I got. Barbara I'm gonna work. What's that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah, gonna work Barbara on. Uh, I'm gonna work on getting that one up here uh, too. Yeah. So uh, very good to have you here, uh, Mr. Johnson. Dave O'Brien. I see 28 degrees in East Texas. I look forward to learning about my mule and spending time with you both every week. That is. That's really nice to hear. We do not take that for granted, Dave. Thank you so much. Laura is watching from Tennessee. It is wet. It is cold. Ice is starting to form. So we got a weather update there from Tennessee. Also, if you're going to be driving through Tennessee, just know it's wet, cold, and ice is starting to form. Thank you, Laura. Good to have you here. Kathy is watching. Now, Steve, uh, we had a little bit of a trick in the email that we sent out just to get folks to open it and uh, just about scared Kathy to death. So, I put in the comments or in the subject line for your email, I said, last live stream. And then when you open it up, it says, yep, it's the last live stream of January. <laughs> I got you, Kathy. That one was just some good old fashioned fun. Wordsmithing. We're good to have you. Here. We're glad to have you here, Kathy. Thanks for joining. She says, howdy, y'all. It scared me when the email said last live chat. Then I saw last live chat of January. Woo, what a relief. Yes, we're glad to have you here. We'll be back next week. Tammy's watching from a 13 balmy degrees here in Wales, Utah. Uh, Zet is watching from Flagstaff, Arizona, where it's 31 degrees. The snow is melting a little. Lane is watching from 31 degrees uh, winter day in central Oregon. Steve, he's got a question. How does your downhill hip pad work to make my mule comfortable okay so number one a pad does not make a saddle fit all right here's the problem that we have folks is is you don't understand confirmation okay confirmation that's really really important and confirmation has a lot to do with the type of horse that is the mama of your mule or the type of donkey that is the daddy of your mule. And that is this, when a hip, I think we got some pictures, don't we there, Dave, you know, of, of a mule there. You see how the hip is higher than the wither and you've got kind of a big deep slope across there. Now, what we tried to do originally 
is we we built it up in the front with another part of a pad, but then we bridged it. So we weren't able to have a solid uh, uh, pad go all the way across. Now remember now, the bar of my saddle fits the bone structure. That's really important to remember. And, and if you've got a horse bar, it's going to put pressure in different places, even with my pads or other pads. So what we do then is we take from the wither and we take and we have it one inch. And as it goes back, it tapers to about a quarter inch or so. All right. Now, here's, the, here's what it does. It makes up for poor conformation that your mule has. You see, your mule has, this one here, has a quarter horse rump. It's nice. Look at the big Gaskin muscle there above the knee. It really shows up good, especially in this picture there, okay? On down lower, down lower, down lower to the right a little bit, to the right on the other leg there, right in there. You see part of that Gaskin muscle and then go to the left right across. That's Gaskin muscle. Now, that is the motor off of the back legs, but I it comes back to it. These quarter horse mules are built to do what? Work cattle. And therefore they got the hip that's high that puts the front of the mule down or the horse down so that they can work their cattle. Well, that's fine for a flat ground. That's fine for working cattle, but it's not fine for you and I who rides trails going up a hill, down a hill, this sort of thing. And here's the deal. When you have a downhill hip, that means the the your rider will always be wanting to go forward and the saddle always wants to go forward and even if you've got a breaching and a real tight fence real tight cinch that bar still goes into the wither you see where that wither is and that arrow is pointing down that saddle wants to go into the wither you've got a lot of mules that don't want to make a turn mostly right hand turns because the bar is incorrectly made or because they're only using a blanket and they've got a real high shoulder, not a wither, folks. If you put the saddle up on a wither on a mule like you do a horse, you will cripple that mule, all right? Now, so what that does, now get this in your mind, it's thicker in the front, so it brings the front of my saddle up, but it does not bridge because it fits my bar all the way across. Otherwise, you're going to have an area that is going to bridge. It's going to touch at the kidneys, touch at the at the scapula, and you're going to bridge in the middle, and you're going to have two sore places. So that's how I designed the pad. Now, again, folks, like everything else, I designed it because I, I had a problem. And when I have problems with mules, and it's not just a matter of seeing wet people, people that are that, that don't have a lot of knowledge of mules. They say, oh, uh, it's it's uh, wet and dry spots on the back or on the pad. No, it's not, okay? You can have different wet spots, different dry spots, depending on the time of the year and how much, how much moisture is in the air. High, when you have high humidity, you're gonna have a whole different thing. So what it amounts to is seeing them being used, seeing that mule going up a mountain, seeing that mule going across an area and watching him and feeling him and knowing, feeling the small things. That's one of the downsides of when, when you have beginner riders or horses riding horses is you, you don't feel, don't feel that mule putting his foot down and picking it up or that donkey picking his foot up and putting it down. And that horse can, you know, they can have feelings too and you can feel it too, but that's what that does. It brings it, the saddle up in the front and it shapes the, to my bar on my saddle. And notice on my pads, if you ever see my pads, they're only thick, about six inches thick at my bar area only. Not a big old thick pad. Now I had a lady ask me from Prescott here uh, just, uh, uh, just yesterday. She says, what we used to do, Steve, we'd add extra pads in order to make up for the fit. I said, yeah, okay, but here's the problem. The mule pays the price for that. How is that? Well, now that I've got all these, these pads 
up over top. Now, just picture it like this. Here's the bar of the saddle. Here's a pad. Here's a pad. Now I have the bar up off of the back. Now I have to over tighten the cinch in order to keep the saddle from rolling. And guess who pays the price to get my fat butt up on that mule? Who pays the price? The mule does. Because now you have to cut him in two and cut off his wind and cut off his breathing and this sort of thing in order to be able to keep that saddle in place. Not fair to the mule. Not fair to the donkey, okay? So how did I develop this pad? I had one of my uh, apprentices uh, 20 years ago almost. She had a beautiful mule like this mule in this picture with a, with a, I mean, a working nice mule. But if she wasn't such a good rider, she'd always feel forward in the saddle. But she's a good rider, so she'd sit straight up and down. But the mule had a downhill hip. So we tried this and we tried that. And we cut pads and we made things work. Finally, we got a pattern that was working consistently to keep the mule sound, not to keep a wet back, not to keep a dry back or spots so that we could see the stride of the mule and we knew if it was sound or not. You know, got that? Okay. So I, I went into a ton of information there, but listen, folks, if you don't have a sound back, you're not sound. And I can tell you how. I've seen plenty of sore backs on mules. And I've had it myself. And I know you have. But just look. See? You see the confirmation on that mule? You see his belly? His belly is hourglass shaped to the shoulders. Mules carry their weight down low. Horses carry their weight up high. That's why you have to have the back cinch be the tightest, front cinch be the loosest. Or otherwise, what happens is the front cinch, look at all, look at all your saddles out there. When you saddle up, you'll see that front cinch is at an angle. What does that do? It pulls the saddle forward. Oh, wait a minute, Steve, I've got a breaching. Yeah, you've got a breaching, but it don't mean diddly if you over tighten that front cinch, okay? Now, but Steve, I've got a back tight, tight back cinch. It don't mean diddly if you over tighten that front cinch because that front cinch is going to bring the saddle forward because of the way the mule is made, okay? So there it is, you know, that's what my downhill hip hat does. It does not make your saddle fit. It takes my bar, which fixes the skeletal structure, and it follows that design in order to keep the front of the saddle up. Good question. Always love having those questions come through. Give us an opportunity to talk about it again and make sure folks who have heard us talk about it in the past get a refresher and folks who haven't uh, get an opportunity to hear all about that. So, uh, and yeah, thank you. Get that come along coffee. You can get the come along hit the or the the downhill hit pad and the come along coffee at muleranch.com. Make it a good day. Okay, let's see. Hopping back over here, uh, Linda, the mule servant, and Theo, the crunchy one-eyed mule in Frosty Central Ohio. If I know Linda, there's a story there to be had. Carol is watching from St. James, uh, Missouri. Twenty-two degrees here. Uh, let's see here. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Cowboy Ken is watching. Hello, guys. 32 degrees from Connecticut. Thank you for the prompt response. Greatly appreciate it. You got it, Ken. Glad to get that taken care of. Uh, Trinity Powers. Hey. Hello, fellas. Six, negative 16 this morning. Warmed up to 23. Uh, in, in Wyoming. Yeah, Warmed up, I guess that's what you call it. Now and sunny. Thank you for all you do for giving us confidence to work with our mules. There we go. Gain trust. Hey, get Trinity. results. What's hey, that? Trinity. I was telling, hey, Trinity, you're not signed up for my Montana clinic yet. It's not during hunting season. So you've got no reason for you and that cute little girl that you ride with be up there in Superior, Montana. It's not ways from where you live. It's not too far at all in Wyoming. So y'all, I just put a link in the comments section. Yeah, Steve is going, Queen Valley Mule Ranch is coming to Montana. It's June 2nd through the 4th, 2023. You got plenty of opportunity to make your plans, get the time off work, uh, decide how you want to get up there, et cetera, et cetera. There are participant spots still available if you want to bring your animal and there are spectator spots available. Uh, there is campground available. It is primitive camping, but there is a cook tent and I believe outhouses available. There is a cabin, although I don't know, has the cabin been rented yet, Steve? Do you know? 
No, it has not. We've got several people looking at it, but so, you know, you wouldn't believe who's coming to this clinic. Try me. David Pingali, the coffee man. Ooh, come along coffee himself. Yes. Coffee by David. That's great. Hey, and, and, and guess who else? Ah. Uh, Virginia Shepherd. Hey, that's a, Virginia's been watching with us for a long time now. She's worked so yeah. hard. She's been training all herself. And I'll tell you what, Dave, we got to we gotta have Virginia on this show sometime because she'll tell you. You and them horse people are saying, oh, don't do it that way. Oh, don't do it that way. That's not good to do it that way. And Virginia has called me up and said, Steve, these horse people are saying this. I said, yeah, horse people say that. You know, did, did it work for you? She goes, no, it didn't. I'm sticking with you. All right, you know, but but Virginia, I get this. She bought herself a trailer. She's training her mule to go in the trailer. And she's driving from Santa Fe, New Mexico to Superior, Montana. Dedication. Yeah. That's dedication. I love that. That's great. Y'all, I'll put a link in the comment section where you can get all the details. We're letting you know well ahead of time so you can make the necessary arrangements. I sure would love to see you out there. It would be a lot of fun. Uh, so go check that out. And muleranch.com, there's a banner up at the very top or you can click on clinics in the uh, store menu and find out everything you need to know. Roger is watching as he does from Milan, New York, 30 degrees and cloudy. Froggies and Doggies is watching 18 degrees here in Northwest Missouri. Sun is shining. My question is, how do I begin getting my young donkey, 18 months old, to start standing still exactly? Thanks, Mari Nelson, Mule Ranch. Come along, Hitch. Come along, Hitch. Come along, Hitch. Folks, listen. Watch the horse trainers. You'll hear them say, let the horse keep going until his feet move. Quit moving. And, and let him keep going. They had him go around in a circle like this on the end of a lunge rope. And when his feet quit working, then bump him and say, good. You know, I guarantee you, try that at the Grand Canyon. Why, why allow the donkey or the mule or the horse to make that decision. That's called breaks, folks. Breaks. Anybody can teach a mule or a donkey or a horse to move. Anybody can. Why is that? Because the flight and fright response. Why is that? Because a mule and a donkey and horses are on the bottom of the feet of the chain, a food chain, and they are going to get ate. So for them to stand still, no, okay? How do we do it? All right, I know a lot of you are writing in here right now. You already know, don't you? The come along hitch, yes. The come along hitch, like you've seen Sherman Johnson had there on that little mule, the come along hitch. You teach them to stand still first. Anybody can teach one to move, but you teach them to stand still first, first. And then you have them go around in circles and all this sort of thing. You see here, here's Sherman Johnson. He trained this mule himself, didn't spend a bunch of money on a horse trainer that would that will do it. Because here's, here's the thing, folks. People are worried they're going to make a mistake. Do you think a horse trainer is going to be uh, flawless? No, no. I've got a client of mine who bought a mule for $18,000 in Oregon and had it shipped to North Carolina. She couldn't hardly even touch it seven months ago. She even had the guy who, who she purchased the mule from, who was a horse trader. Yes, be careful of them horse traders. And, and he come out and rode and got bucked off, got himself in the hospital. She started paying a trainer who started watching my videos. And guess what? Today they have the saddle and today they're, they've done six months of groundwork. And you should see some of the pictures that she sent us. It's great, you know, do it yourself. So how, how to make the donkey be still? Number one, start with the come along hitch. There's a ground communication kit. Use that. Folks, if I say mule, just add donkey to it. Mule and donkey is the same thing. Now, we've also got uh, saddle, uh, saddle foundation donkey videos as well. But, but here's the main thing, folks. It ain't worth to ride 
Don't worry about riding. Anybody can ride. Get the mule to listen to you first on the ground. Teach them to stand still and quiet. Very good. Yeah, I put a link to the Ground Foundation starting kit in the comment section there. Y'all can check that out. Uh, it comes with three three items. And folks listening right now, they'll tell you uh, that the three items are the essentials. Number one, it comes with a rope halter. There are times you'll need a rope halter. Uh, you will need a rope halter when you do sur single training. So after you do uh, your, not after, but as you continue to add new things, uh, you're going to start with just the come along rope. But eventually you're going to get to sur single training and you're going to need an adjustable rope halter. So the ground foundation starting kit comes with an adjustable rope halter. It has the knots in the correct places, but you put that up on the wall. You're not going to need it right away. You'll need it as a training tool for some specific things. Uh, you may want to use it to, you know, lead them from here to there if, if that's what you want to do. But you put that up on the wall for when you need it. The second thing the kit comes with is the come along rope. And that is your catch all. That is your save all. That is your answer to just about every problem that you encounter. It's going back to the basics and using that come along rope as an extension of your body communicating. Now, ideally, you want to get to a point where they respect just the lightest weight of that come along rope on their nose. And you don't have to do hardly anything, but just pick up your hands and slightly move it. That's where you want to get. And so it's going to take some time. You train maybe like what, like four to six hours a week total, Steve? Yeah. Four to six hours a week total using the come along rope. Uh, one of the things, last clinic we had out at uh, Mule Ranch, uh, there was a couple there and they had this animal that just wanted to drag them all over the place. And um, one of the, th I like, it was a cool learning moment for me because I know all the answers, but I don't have the understanding. I, I don't know how to do it because I haven't done it, but I know what Steve would say. So I'm watching them and this mule is just everywhere the mule wants to go. Mule's just moving his head, taking a step here, taking a step there. And I said, look, we can ask Steve for sure, but I think what you want to do is have that come along rope. And as soon as the mule is no longer looking straight, even right now, we're just talking. But if he doesn't look straight, bump him and get him to straighten right back up because he's learning right now that he can move all over the place. Felt pretty good because, yeah, that's exact. I asked Steve, I was like, hey, here's what I said. Was that correct? He goes, yep, that's exactly what it is. And so it's just little minor things like that. So it comes with the come along rope. And then it comes with the problem mule video, which instructs you how to use it. So we don't push equipment. We don't push tack. We'll tell you uh, the solutions. Sometimes they're free. Sometimes they cost. Sometimes they're easy. And sometimes they take time and they're a little bit more difficult. But we'll tell you the truth no matter what it is. And then you can make the decision. But we do say get the ground foundation starting kit because it is the foundation of everything. Uh, going back over to uh, the uh, comments here, Matthew is watching from Lexington, North Carolina, where it's a rainy day, 55 degrees, Pedro's doing great. Uh, I'm guessing Pedro is the mule, so good to hear that. Uh, Dolores is watching. Howdy, guys. We got David Pingelli, Coffee by David, 69 here today in beautiful Manchester, Georgia. Says, I'm bringing coffee to Montana. If those weren't the greatest words ever spoken, I don't know what are. Lane says, Steve. With your saddle pad and cinch, my mule cinches. So my mule is cinches. So I went to a longer cinch to change my leverage. Your thoughts. I might get a couple of mixed up words there. Uh, do you understand what he's saying? I'm not really understanding. There is some something which we call, you know, cinch, uh, uh, cinch, uh, or um, cinchy, you know. Cinchy. In other words, what happens is when you start pulling up on the cinch, the mule starts moving around a lot. So it, I'm not sure if, he, if he's saying that is this. All right. So if he's saying my mule is cinchy, I put a longer cinch on that won't fix it. OK, it's not a matter of the length of the cinch. The cinch at the end of the day, at the end of the ride from D ring up on the saddle to D ring on the cinch. If you got three inches by the end of the day, perfect. It's not rocket scientists to have those cinches to be a certain length, a certain height, this sort of thing. It's not. 
Here's what happened with cinches, folks. Cinches get a bad rap, but you know what that bad rap is? Anytime you point toward a problem, look here. I got three more pointing toward me. Here's what I do for cinching. And then maybe Elaine can, can get back and say, hey, Steve, this is what I do. But this is what I do. I put my saddle on. I take my rear cinch up first and I have it just start to be snug against the belly. So it's just starting to be there. I do not lock it down with the tongue in the hole. I do not do that. Matter of fact, I don't tie it up above. I don't do that. I use the lock on the cinch. Now, when I do that, I then take my breaching and I slide it off onto the rump. Now listen to the steps. Then I take my breast collar and I attach it to my strap on the pummel. Listen to the steps. Then I take my front cinch and I bring it up where it's just touching the hair on the mule's belly. You hear that? And then I lock it off if I can. And then I loosen my mule off. Of, I take my mule and I walk him around. Now, a lot of people tie up. And as you hear me tell you, you take my mules and you throw a lead rope on the ground. They will stand there till the cows come home. All right. Because they respect the come along rope and they respect the halter. Now, once I loosen them up and I walk them around in a little 10 foot circle, nice and quiet, I am looking for this. Is my mule comfortable? Is my donkey happy? Listen to the words. When the head is down, happy donkey. When the nose is on the vertical, happy mule. Remember when I say donkey, I mean mule. When I say mule, I mean donkey. Same thing. All right. Same thing when it comes to this. When they give a big sigh and they drop their head and they come around, when they come back around to the spot where you've been saddling up, take it up another notch on the rear cinch. Slow and easy. Lock it. Take up your lead rope. Walk them around in another circle. 10 foot, 12 foot or so. Nice, quiet circle. When the mules head, not the circle, not because you think it's time, not because we come back to the place. When the mule and the donkey drops his head and gets quiet, he's happy. When the head is elevated and the ears are kind of stiff, he's unhappy. So I may have to walk him around a little bit more, a step or two. Here's what people do. When the mule is standing there, when the donkey's standing there, they try to get the saddle tight up and cinch it up right there when he's standing still. Don't do that. Walk him around. Let the saddle start soaking in. Let the rear cinch start soaking in. Here's, have you ever watched people when they, <laughs> they, you, you know, you know, you know, Dave, I, I watch people a lot doing things and kind of get an understand what happened to the mule. Yeah. But here's what people do. You know, there's a dance that the cowboys do and cowgirls do is dance. I call it the Wrangler dance. What they do is before they get ready to get in the saddle, they pull up on the britches, pull up on the right, pull up on the left, and they bring their leg up and they move their, they move their jeans around because most of them are so tight we can't get in anyway because we're too fat. That's me. And, and they move the jeans around so they get their foot in the stirrup. What do you think's happening to the mule? If you will not tighten the cinches up right off the bat and do it three times coming around, when you come around that third time, you're not going to tighten up the cinch. You're going to put the bridle on. When the bridle's on, you're going to take the mule, move him around another step, make a 10 foot circle, come back. Then listen, now here comes the front cinch's turn. Now we snug the front cinch. I can still slide my hand in there and we tighten that back cinch one more notch. Not done yet. Now I walk my mule off in a nice circle. And listen, the cooler it is, 
the more time I'm going to take to saddle my mule. Here's this, why? <clears throat> the mule has to move around to be warm. Just like you and I, you know, we, can, we put a bunch of jackets on stuff, but if we get to moving around, we'll get warmer. So the mule needs to be warmed up. Why do a lot of mules, why do a lot of donkeys move or why do they, they take off as soon as you get in them? Because the rider didn't prepare the mule or donkey to get on. So he didn't do it. And the mule and donkey's cold and all they want to do is get to moving. So they're saying, hurry up, get on. And we blast and get on. Don't do that. Prepare them. Get a hold of the horn, shake the horn really good and get the mule to spread his feet out. And we got videos on that all, all around YouTube and cl then climb on, okay? But, but hear me, don't tighten that cinch up with the mule standing still. Don't make it as tight as you need to make it. You do it in stages and you will not have a cinchy mule. It is not a matter of the length of the cinch. It is a matter of you cinching up a, a hole at a time. Very good. Uh, hopefully that answered your question there, Lane. If it didn't, you can clarify uh, in the comment section and we'll get to it. Uh, hopping back over and seeing who else is hanging out with us. We've got uh, Dory is watching from Virginia, gray and drizzly. It's mud season. Uh, Linda says, yes, horse people. My horse border watches me work with Theo and she says two things in a puzzled voice. Don't you talk to him? How can he learn voice commands? Does he, and does he listen to you better after you do that? I keep explaining. I'm teaching him to stand still and stand square. And Linda is on it. And uh, that horse border is learning a thing or two. Uh, let's see here. Froggies and doggies says same as ground tide, correct? Uh, I can't remember what you were said where we were talking about ground tide. Well, ground, ground tie is, is yes, wiggling the rope. So the first of all, we get the, we got to get the mule to quit looking to the left, quit looking to the right, because they're saying, is there something going to eat me over here? Is there something going to eat me over there? Is there something going to eat me back over there? You hear that? You as the herd leader, hear this, you're the herd leader. You make looking over there, bump, uncomfortable, looking over there, bump, uncomfortable, bump with what? Bump with the come along hitch. Yes. You see, when you bump, 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 that tells that mule, that donkey to stand still, okay? Once they quit looking to the left and the right and looking around, they're looking straight. Now, now, because here's the deal. If they look to the right, guess what? They're going to go to the right. If they look to the left, guess what? They're thinking about going to the left, too, okay? So straight first, then as they go to, as, the, as you go to, step away and we've got some video on this on, on ground time is is that you put the feed the rope out until it goes on the ground and then if the mule or donkey goes to look to the right or left a little wiggle a little wiggle ask tell demand and away you go so Steve's talking about these videos. We've got hundreds of videos over on YouTube. Y'all can go check that out. You can search for whatever videos you're looking for and you'll find just all sorts of them there. Uh, we do have videos on Steve's website and those videos are his paid instructional videos. And so sometimes we'll reference those. What he's talking about here though are not paid instructional videos. They're the ones on YouTube. Uh, but on the website, when you become a customer, there's a collection of videos that automatically arrive into, uh, into your video library, whether you purchase something or not. And so some of those videos, uh, there's short clips here or there on YouTube, but the entire things are curated and collected inside of the website. So, But mostly everything he's talking about, I think, is able to be found on the uh, YouTube channel. So Steve, let's talk a little bit about uh, Mule Riders Martingale. Let's talk about the double twisted wire snap a bit. Let's talk about Barbara. We got this photo, uh, these photos that came in from Barbara. Hi Steve, I put the Martingale on Daisy today. Wow, that tongue was all over it. Can you look at the picture to see what you think? I worked with her like you did in the video. Then she stood for a while, a, a while with it in her mouth. When she was quiet, I took off. What would you say? What are we looking at, Steve? And what would you say to Barb? 
Okay, so first of all, we're looking at the mule with the surf single on. Notice the cinch on the surf single. Remember, I was just talking earlier that it's at an angle. That's what happens. When it's at an angle like that, it pulls the, the cinch forward or the saddle forward. In this case, the surf single. So what we have on here, this is my mule rider's martingale. Okay, and what this does is it keeps them thinking straight. It keeps them thinking nose on the vertical. It keeps them thinking head down without anybody touching them. Notice there's a string that comes up from this adjustment strap from between the legs. It goes over the snaffle bit and then into the rein. You see that? That's like a violin bow on a violin. When that string starts to touch first, it gives that mule, that donkey, a little subtle touch that says, you're about to be uncomfortable. That's it. Now here's the problem, is most folks just want to ride and they pick up on the reins and they put a lot of weight in that mouth and they end up, the mule ends up bracing. And so this string, notice nobody's on his back, this string is communicating to the mule, get your head down, get your nose on vertical. Now, why is the tongue wagging around? No big deal, okay? What happens is when you put the bit in the mule's mouth, you'll see in the video that, that goes with the mule rider's martingale that I let the bit hang down, bumping the front teeth. A molly mule has incisors only in the front right here. A John mule has a canine right here. Wolf tooth is up in the upper top. So that bit on this molly mule is hanging down, bumping them front inside in front incisor teeth. All right. What it does then when it bangs on this, she wants to be comfortable. So she's moving her tongue around saying, I'm trying to find a way to be comfortable with this. So they'll move their tongue up on the top. They'll put the tongue on the bottom. All she's doing is saying, how can I be comfortable? Finally, just like you heard her say, just like you heard Miss Vance say, she says, when her mule got quiet, she took the bridle off. You see, because she ended at a good note. So she seen that the mule got quiet in a bit. The mule had it in its mind. Hey, this is better right here. You take it off. And once you take it off, you give them a little pet and then, you know, you move them a few steps around and you put it back on, let them go at it again. Everything in three, six, nine, 12 steps. You got it? So today she's going to pick the bit up and she gets quiet. She gets quiet. I pull the bridle off. I give her a little scratch. I'll move her over a few steps. Notice I said, move them over a few steps. Cause remember when I said on my t-shirt here, every day is a different day for a mule. Every day is a different day for a donkey. When you move them 10 feet, that is a new world for them folks. Yeah, even 10 feet. So you move them, put the bridle back on, let them, let them ask questions. Their tongue wags all around. They move it up and down. Notice that's kind of what some of what the mule's doing here right now. Open and closing, open and closing. But that bridle is actually hanging down. You never create one wrinkle or two wrinkles. The bridle is hanging down, bumping the front teeth. Pretty soon, if you notice here in this one picture, I think we got some other pictures too, Dave, but the one picture here of the side view, notice the, the nose is coming on the vertical. Notice folks, how loose the reins are. Notice how loose that martingale is. Do you see that? It's not tight. So therefore, what does that mean? It means that that bridle, that bit, is doing the right job. That's what it means. Because if somebody was on there, they would hold on to the reins and then the mule would get on the fight. And 
push, embrace, and this sort of thing. This way here, with this surf single, I'm telling you folks, surf single training makes your mule comfortable. It makes no difference how the breaching is. Notice the breaching, you know, is not adjusted correctly. Makes no difference. The main purpose for that breaching is to keep that sur single from going forward, which is what it's doing. We're keeping going forward because the mule roots on the bit. I want to be comfortable. I want to be comfortable. And when they finally get quiet, kaboom, here we are. There was one other picture that she sent. So there were three total. The third one was very similar to the other side view. So that's why I didn't have it in there. You could get the and picture. She said, so She actually yeah. sent two emails that I sent you with, with two different sets of pictures. I'll see if I can find the other one. I, I did find the first one. Um, question here from Bob. Bob wrote in, I just bought two Belgian fillies so I can make baby mules. One is 18 months and one is six months and both have been handled very little. Can I use the come along rope for halter training sessions on these horses? Absolutely. This, the person that I learned from to use the come along hitch was Nick West from Sundry, Alberta, Canada. That man was on the first 10 more 10 man board of the Calgary Stampede. He's in the history books of Canada, not only being a raw, a raw hider, but a bronc rider plus, I mean a bronc rider. So I learned from him and guess what? They never used mules back then. It was all horses. And what did they train on? The come along hitch was a horse. I've, I've used the come along hitch to train cattle. Listen, if y'all got show cattle, you use that come along hitch, you can teach a cow really good, to, you know, for, for your show steers and your show heifers, okay? I've used it on camels, hear that? I've used it on camels to get them straightened up. I've used them on zonkeys. I've used them on sources. I've used them on, donk on, uh, on a donkey. I've used them on mules. I've used, I've used them on everything but a pig. Oink, oink. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, next question comes in from Jordan. Jordan is looking to buy a mule. I am going to look at this mule possibly to purchase. Just looking for tips on what to look for. And so I've got a couple pictures right here that she sent in, Steve. And, uh, and so uh, I will say, Jordan, we don't say whether or not you should buy the animal. That's up to you. You'll have to be the one to do the research. But we will tell you what we see. Steve, what do you see here? I see a horse person trying to sell a mule. I see a saddle sitting on top of a scapula. No breaching. Okay. So folks, listen to me. Here's what happens. It's a nice looking mule. Fairly decent confirmation, but the hip has got a severe downhill. Okay. But here's the deal. When it comes down to it, when folks go to these sales, they'll buy a mule and and get a good price on it. They'll bring it home. They'll ride it and this sort of thing. But here's the problem, folks. See what they're riding? Horse-wise, look at that saddle directly on top of the scapula. Okay, now here's the problem, folks. Right now, this mule's riding pretty good. Right mule, now, this mule's doing pretty good. But it's, it's coming. And just like some of, the, some of the stuff that I've told you all is this, is that... The horsemen are cantering, loping, and riding the hills and this sort of thing. And every time that scapula comes up, it bangs on that saddle. Now, you don't know. You see it looking good. The vet sees it looking pretty good. And they think, okay, a sound mule. A couple of years later, the mule starts tripping. Well, the farrier comes out. He trims. He balances. He puts the shoes on. The mule still trips. If we would have taken, when we do our vet check, listen to me, folks, very, very important. Not only do you want to vet check the feet at the hairline for ring bone, hear that? Yep, ring bone. But you want to have them x-ray that scapula for a broken down scapula. Now, we've got, what is it, a, a letter we got from that one veterinarian uh, out of Arlington, Texas, that found the problem to that one mule. And, and here it is, folks. They found that on this mule, that there was a little tiny place 
on the scapula. She, he said it was like a cauliflower looking place where the saddle had been banging on this mule in the past. This was a young mule, three years old. And every time the saddle would hit that, the mule would go to buck him and would, would buck my client off. Well, the client thought it was the saddle. I told him first, and all of you listen to me, first have the veterinarian do x-rays on that scapula and make sure it is solid. Because like right here, you know, first thing I would tell people, I wouldn't buy that mule. Why is that? Number one is confirmation. I can see his hip is real high. Your saddles want to go forward all the time. Okay. Can I see the rest of the mule? I like to see the rest of the mule. This is what else I would like to see. We get a vet check. Once, you, once you've seen the mule and you decide it's what you want, a vet check. But before that, before you come into that purchasing part, you want to see the owner of the mule catch the mule, lead it over to the saddling area. You want to see him pick up all four feet. You want to see him saddle them and brush them. You want to see him climb on nice and quiet. And you do not care if you go on a trail ride. You want to see that mule in a 10 foot circle, side pass, turn on the forehand, turn on the hindquarters. That tells me this mule has a foundation. It's not that he's trained. I didn't say that word. The training, unfortunately, comes by people as they're riding every day. But if they have a good foundation, then they'll side pass, turn on the forehand, turn on the hindquarters, pick up all four feet, okay, and, and go from there. First thing I would tell the people is, number one, what I would tell you, the owner, is from what I can see of the picture, the hip is too high. And what I can see, that's without the saddle. What I can see of the picture with the saddle on the mule, because the hip is too high, if they put that saddle on there correctly, then it would, the saddle would be pointing downhill. That would mean you, the rider, is always trying to lean back, try to keep that saddle from going forward, okay? Do you see that? Do you see how that saddle is high up in the front? Why is that? It's setting on the scapula. Awesome. Very good. Hopefully that was helpful there, Joanne. Appreciate it. Our next question. This one comes in from Bruce. Uh, Bruce says, uh, Steve and Dave, there are a few different oils I have used on my horse saddles and other leather goods. What does Steve suggest for his saddles? Now, why would you want leather for these saddles, Steve? What are you trying to, or why would you want oil? What are you trying to oil up and what do you recommend? Okay, so recommendation number one is before I start riding my new saddle, I wet it with, with uh, soapy water in a spray bottle and I spray the back half of the fenders, and I spray it underneath the jockey. I turn the fenders, I put a stick in it overnight. I get ready to ride the next day, I wet it, I soak it like an old wet newspaper, I turn the stirrups the way I want, and then I ride. When you want a saddle to fit you, you wet it first, and you ride. You wet it and you ride. Pretty soon, this saddle starts getting a memory, and it's starting to fit you, the rider. Don't just climb in a saddle thinking, yeah, this one fits good. Oh, this one not. No, no. In order for you to really know, you have to ride that saddle and you have to wet it to fit you. Now, number one, you do that. Once the saddle is starting to fit you and you're starting to say, yeah, I like it like this. You let the saddle uh, dry up. Okay. And then you use Neat's foot oil. You know, there's a lot of different companies that have it. Just buy the least expensive needs foot oil you can and oil the back half of the fenders and underneath the jockey. Notice I'm saying the back half because oil is the downside is it will really make your, your clothes uh, kind of dirty. Other thing is too, on the back side <clears throat> is where the oil will penetrate into the saddle. It's where it will penetrate, okay? That's why when I send a saddle out to you, I tell you, do it like this in preparation. Just don't, the first thing people try to do is they put it on the mule to see if it's going to fit. 99% of you don't know if it's going to fit or not. Just like this horse person. Anyway, so go back. I'd use a good knee foot oil. Try to do this, folks. When you're oiling a saddle, 
try to do it someplace warm, like where the sun's beating down on it, and it's 115 degrees, oh yeah, or inside the house or someplace where it's warm. When oil is warm, and you can even warm up the oil, by the way, folks, and brush it in. When oil is warm and the saddle is warm, the oil will penetrate better, all right? But do not, do not oil it until you first shape the saddle and put a few hundred rides on it and say, okay, I like it like that. Now, on the exterior, you can use an olive oil if you want, if you don't want to change the color. Uh, uh, you can use Lexol, L-E-X-O-L. You can use Lexol on it, okay? Personally, I don't care what color it is because here's with me. I'm riding with shaps and shaps will rub into the leather and shaps will create all kinds of colors. I'm riding in, in hot weather, dirty weather, cold weather, frozen weather, all kinds of weather, and I am going to have all kinds of colors on my saddle. That's the way it is. But if you oil it, that's when you start shaping it to you and you start, you start getting the oil where it doesn't squeak. Now, this is something you have to do every single year. Right now, you folks have all your saddles in, in, the, in the saddle shop for the winter or in your storage area. You should be taking them out. You should be checking. Listen, this is no different than preparing for a trip. You check all your tie strings. You check all the places. Here's one of the big things that happens on your breaching, okay? Uh, one of my clients contacted me and said, hey, Steve, my concho's coming loose. Yes, here's what's happening. On that breaching, that breaching is always moving as the animal's moving. And guess what it's doing? That concho is little by little turning around, turning around, turning around, and loosens up and falls out. Then I have people call me up and say, I lost my concho. Listen, folks. Before you ride, check your conchos, make sure they're tight, okay? Before you ride, make sure that all of your billets, all of your tie straps are, are in good shape. That's why I use nylon. Nylon, you don't have to worry about it breaking down and have to keep it oil. If you're using leather uh, tie straps or using billets, you got to keep them super oil because every place you have a bend on leather, every place you will get cracking. So that's what I do. So right now, winter time, folks, now's the time to get your saddle ready for, for spring. Now, every time you ride, check it out. Make sure it's good, okay? My saddle is no different than any place, anything else. They're mechanical, things will fail, but if you keep an eye on it, you'll keep it maintained. All right, next question here. Um, oh, actually, let's hop back over on to uh, <clears throat> YouTube and Facebook here. Um, Karen is watching from cold, rainy Virginia. Dory says, yes, teaching my three mollies to be quiet and still has done wonder, wonders, wonderful training tips. Kristen asked the question, I have a companionship question. I have a mule that currently lives with my horse. I have heard that donkeys need to be with other donkeys. Is it true for mules? Is a donkey good company for a mule or should it be another mule? Steve, what would you say to Kristen? Okay, folks, Here, here's the thing. This is an equine. The equine is always looking for a herd leader. I know people that have bought a goat for their mule so it'd have a companion. And now that mule won't leave or won't go anywhere without that goat. So every trail ride that they go on, they got to take a goat. I know some other people that bought a Shetland pony. Everybody's thinking small, you know, cuddly, yada, yada. They can't go nowhere now without their Shetland pony. Oh, okay. Here's the next one. Here's the tough one. Because mules are very subservient to horses. When you have a horse and a mule together in the same pen, they're eating together, they're, they're pooping together, they're, you know, you got it? You're going to have a severe problem with trying to separate the two, okay? Now, is it okay to put the mule in a corral next to your horse? Yeah, okay, but here's the problem. Anytime you have a horse around, 
that mule is going to gravitate to the horse because you're the predator, he's the prey animal, they prefer to be around the horse because they, they that horse is part of them, they're an equine, and that horse is going to be alert, be going to be looking around for monsters, and you all will notice it as you're all following on a trail ride. Everybody's following the lead guy, and the lead guy is up in the front, and that mule's ears are up looking around. All the other mules are in the back, their ears are flopping. Hey, everything's good. But all of a sudden, the lead mule goes, whoop, what's that? Everybody goes, oh, look, Charlie, see something. What's going on? And everybody gets worried. You, you'll watch us on pack mules, okay? You'll watch us on pack mules, and, and you'll see all them pack mules going down the trail, ears are flopping. But if me, the leady, lead rider, if my mule or my horse that I'm riding, leading the pack stream, comes up with his ears, they're all aware there's getting ready to be a problem. So they all want to make a, a decision. So what am I telling you? Folks, you do not have to buy a pasture mate. Don't listen to these backyard folks, okay? They thinking, oh yeah, we got to have a pasture mate for them to be happy. No, you don't. No, you don't. My wife's mule, and you hear me talk about Stacy a lot, 28 years old when she passed away, we had her from a two-year-old, she spent 26 years in a twin 10 by 20 stall. Did she have meals on both sides of her? Yeah. Did she have meals across the way from her? Yeah. Okay. Yes, she did. But she was in that small pen and she did not have a bunch of others to have to feed with or to contend with. And when they left, oh yeah, she'd go eh, a little bit and then it was over with. Okay. You, and you can put them five miles away. And when they come together, boom. We did the same thing at Yosemite uh, when I was packing freight there. We'd winter the, the horses and the mules in another winter pasture. But when we bring them all together, they'd all gather up and figure out who's going to be whose buddy, and they'll all be together. That's how we choose pack mules for a particular horse. At Yosemite, when we're packing for the government, if those mules, if, I, if they give you a horse and they give you 10 mules to pack, and when we take that horse, and sometimes they give us two horses too, but when we take that horse and those mules gravitate to that horse, that's usually the mules I will try to use for <laughs> to be the pack mules that I'm going to be packing freight on that week. That's usually what I would do. But anyway, don't folks, don't, don't, don't buy into this stuff of backyard people telling you you have to have a, a a animal in the corrals with them or in the pasture with them so that they got a herd bike. No, no, you be the herd leader. You spend the time, you take them out, you feed them, you brush them, you, you spend the time with them. You're the herd leader. Now you're their buddy. I guarantee you, you buy a, a pasture buddy, you're going to have problems the rest of your life. All right, we're almost done here. A next question comes from Donnie. Donnie watched your video uh, all about creating a feed and nutrition program. Steve says, would you have any recommendations for some other feed? I'm in Louisiana and I can't get Lake and Light. It's about 35 degrees here today. What would you say for Donnie? Well, folks, just you know, take the, the article. I know, I know the majority of you can't get Lake and Light and we developed it right here in Arizona. Matter of fact, a new company just bought them out. Uh, and so they're no longer Lake and Cattle Company, Cattle and Feed. But anyway, another story. Uh, when it comes down uh, to the feed, take the ingredients on the back of that package, which you will see in that article, Mules Cannot Stand Prosperity. Take that down and say, what do we have similar to this? Now, look, folks, this is Arizona. You're in Louisiana. You're going to have a little bit different feed you're going to have a little different atmosphere when it comes down to a lot of moisture, when it comes down to wet weather and things like this. This feed is to give you a place to start. It is not the feed you'll feed every day. We developed the Lake and Light with Chuck Lakin and I, and, and we're talking 30 years ago, okay, and developed this feed so that it was kind of like for his meal. And then we started using it with my mules and this sort of thing. It was good feed. We even use it at the Phoenix Zoo 
uh, for, for now as a feeding program. The good thing about the pellets, folks, is this. It's a clean feed. It's the cleanest feed you can get. The biggest problem with feed is most of you all don't know what's in that feed. You buy hay and you're thinking, I got hay, it's good. No, no, there's vitamins and minerals that these meals need and that you are not getting in that hay. Plus the garbage that's in that hay, the salmonella uh, from rat poison, uh, rat parts and, and bird poop and stuff like this. Salmonella poisoning, yes, and we call it colic. And there are types of colics, but a lot of this stuff is because of the of the dirty feed that we're feeding our mules and donkeys. Awesome, great question. Thanks for that. Uh, let's see here. I think we're just about done. Um, uh, let's see here. Oh, oh. Uh, Marsha is watching from rainy Virginia. Here it is, David Scholl. We have gone international. We did not go the entire show without going international. David Scholl has taken us international. Thank you very much. Hot and humid here in Queensland. Love the come along rope. It's making my babies super soft. And just for folks who don't know David, know David he's talking about his uh, mules and donkeys. Uh, not actual human babies. We just want to make sure that uh, we say that. Jim is watching from Maryland, 36 degrees and misting rain. Uh, Miss Backwoods, Linda and Ryan, Northern Maine, dropping to under 18 tonight. Stay warm. Jim from Central Alabama watching where it's 56 degrees and cloudy. Lois is watching. Uh, let's see here. Linda says, Dave, did you get my email with the photo of po Poito Donkey? I think... I think I did, Linda. Let me go back. Let me go back and double check. Uh, Marcia says, "What about synthetic material, Steve?" Well, as far as synthetic goes, like like on my Cordura. Nice thing I like about that. <laughs> there's no maintenance to it. Nice thing I like about that. I, uh, yes, you want to turn the stirrups. As with any saddle, folks, when you put it up after use, always turn the stirrups and put a broom handle through it or a piece of PVC pipe, you go out in my tack room and you turn that, that, that to carousel. My, my saddles are all on carousel. So as you turn it around, it comes to the different saddles. So I always put a stick in. When I put them in a bed in the, in the, in the uh, tack room of my horse trailer, I always turn the fenders. I tie them to the rear strings on the back of the saddle. And that way they keep them turned. So with the Cordura, there's no maintenance to it. The nice thing I like about the Cordura too is it will keep a memory if you turn the stirrups and keep a stick in it. And those stirrups will stay just like they should. So they don't really need much. Matter of fact, there's folks, uh, you, now, I, I think about this. I hardly ever clean my saddles. I make sure they're oiled, okay? Uh, the nice thing about the Cordura, there's no oiling. None, okay? Well, a little bit of oil I do is on the backside, um, and the rest of it is just, it, it maintains, you know, a little dab of oil here and there, but other than that, nope, no maintenance. You ever use the come along rope to train a llama? Steve, Bobby is asking. Um, no. I, would, I, I wouldn't think it would be any different than doing a camel um, at all, but I... I have never done that. Bobby, let me know how you do with that. Let us know, Bobby. Send pictures. Uh, let's yeah, send see pictures. here. Bobby says, seems as if my mule controls what my llama does. Are there some mule llama dynamics that are well established, Steve? <laughs> um, we haven't really talked much about llamas. We don't yeah, have a whole much, bunch of llama people don't here. Get along. Equine okay. folks and llamas don't get along. Some of the biggest wrecks I've ever seen with pack animals and this sort of thing is because somebody was leading a pack llama, you know. Uh, uh, I can tell you that, that that mule will kill that llama. Have I heard about it? Yep, I know about a couple, couple sad stories, but we won't go into that. Uh, folks, always, always, always keep your mules away from your babies, okay? your baby donkeys, your baby cattle, your baby calves and this sort of thing. Be careful, your small children. 
because the mule side, the donkey side of that mule can be a predator and they can stop a hole in a dog or a llama or even a kid. So folks, always be careful, always. Uh, I, there was another one here that I, I got, Steve. Uh, Grant sent a message, I was ho message in. I was hoping to order a trail riding bit for my daughter's mule and found your website. I believe I need a five, uh, five and a quarter to five and a half. Do you know when you'll get more in stock? So now I don't know when we're going to be getting more. I can't remember what size we have in and what size we're out of, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk to Grant about getting the right size um, and then if we've got an update. Yeah. Well, the update is last I heard from my company that makes my bits, which is Rainsman. Okay. And those bits, by the way, folks, you can't just contact Rainsman and buy the bit. The only way you can buy my trail rider bit is through me. That, that's it. So don't get in a hurry and say, I think I'll go buy it from Rangeman. It's not for sale. Okay. They won't sell it to you. I designed that bit, especially for the palate of a mule, because that is what the trail rider does. It communicates the palate. Now I do have uh, uh, some information on the video, which Dave can put on up there that shows about how to measure. Okay. And it doesn't hurt. If you measure out a five inch and you want to put a five and a half inch, folks, you're only talking about a quarter inch on each side. That's all you're talking about. So it's not, if you do not have to have the bit sitting in the mouth like it does a horse, you have a donkey palate, you have donkey skull, uh, skull uh, and upper and lower jaw. So you will have also the donkey side will create big lips on these mules and and you're not honestly fitting the jaw structure like you should so just go, go use that measurement it's a general measurement it works good and go from there all right let's see here um i think that's it let's see judy eight degrees lots of snow plus another beautiful day eileen says hello everyone finally we have sunshine 16 degrees in Nebraska today. Uh, Eileen says the Queen Valley Mule t-shirt is very nice. So y'all can get yourselves t-shirts. Uh, let's see here. Where is we'll it? We'll see the pictures. We'll see I pictures. Got I got it right there. Uh, I've got the, let's see. I, ha I have the other one somewhere. I can't, I can't figure out where I put it, but this is the, uh, this is the mule one. We have a donkey one too. And y'all can go to the website, check that out. So uh, get your t-shirt. Uh, Marsha says backyard people would be a cool name for a band. We're looking at you, Marsha. Tell us when your first date is and we'll, uh, we'll come out and see your band play. Uh, Douglas from Kansas is watching. Miss Backwood says, are the shirts still on sale? Uh, no, uh, that deal is over, but the shirts are still available. Uh, Miss Backwood. So you and, uh, your significant other, uh, can still get those shirts there. Uh, that's it, Steve. That's all we've got for today. Uh, anything else you want to say before we're all done here? No, I'm getting ready to go out and service my tractor. I'm changing the oil on it and stuff. That's why I went and, and put my coveralls on, kind of prepared myself here. Get the coveralls on, go down and get that done. And then we've been spraying for weeds and stuff. The weeds are getting to be pretty tough. But anyway, long story short is this, folks. Train your donkey and mule yourself. When you are talking to people about buying a mule, don't hear this stuff that my kids ride it and you watch them go in water and all that stuff. No, no. In a 10 foot circle, listen to some of the stuff that I'm trying to help you out with. So many people, Dave, are, it's, it's horrible. They're spending this phenomenal amount of money for this supposedly trained mule or donkey and they get it home and they can't do anything with it. You know, spend the time folks, Spend the time, okay, and you can get it. So away we go, Dave. I'm going to go out and get my tractor oil changed and, and take Jess down and work my sheep and go from there. Awesome. Sounds good. Everyone, thanks for hanging out with us. We'll see you next week. Take care. God bless.